You know, it's really a shame that people are not allowed to sit down and, and talk about things, you know. When the churches and all the religious people would just say, hey, you know, let's be fair and let's talk about where all this stuff came from that we think is, you know, Christianity or whatever. But what's really sad about it is there is a truth that is kept from people. And people think, well, our religion is the true religion, not realizing that our religion is stolen and copied word from word from numerous old religious myths and cults. I mean, it's true. People can get mad at you for that, say, well, hey, you, know, you shouldn't say that. But it's true. But you're, you know, you're, you're kind of damned almost as some kind of a traitor or a cultist or a Satanist if you dare say such a thing. But Christianity is a religious concept that comes uh, from the ideas of many ancient beliefs. Buddhists, Jews, Hindus, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Persians, they took something from everybody. The nativity, like we talked about, the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ is copied word for word from the birth of Hare Krishna. Devaki was a, a virgin. She found that she was pregnant. An angel came and told her she was going to give birth to Hare Krishna, who was God. The wicked king, whose name was Kansa, heard that Hare Krishna was going to try to overthrow his kingdom. So he turns around and kills all the children two years and younger. Uh, she gives birth in a, in a cave. The, the stars were very auspicious. And uh, the, the cowherd girls, the shepherds of the time, were the first ones to come and see him. What, it's copied. So the birth of Jesus is copied word for word from that. And it has to be that way because that was thousands of years before Jesus. So why did they copy it? And then, of course, he's born on December the 25th, which is the day that the sun has been born in, since the beginning of time because of the winter solstice. It's the end of the winter solstice, and the sun is born on December the 25th. You can, you, can, you can start, if you want to track basically the origin of Christianity, you can start in ancient Egypt where science really flourished, but there was a, a great uh, contrast between the people who had money, the people that didn't have any money, and the people that had the money were the priests and the politicians. <laughs> hey, I mean, you, you heard about this guy Tilton. I guess they finally got him off the air. Well, this guy's making, you know, he was an evangelist on television. He was making more than Madonna and, and, and Michael Jackson put together. But these guys lived in luxury. And, and, and you know, what you see with these, you know, evangelists, I'm not talking about pastors of local churches now. I'm not talking about that. Pastors of local churches are, are fine people. They're doing the best they can. I'm talking about these show business people on TV that do this stuff. But the Egyptians started this whole thing and really it, it turned into what we call Christianity because they had a longing for a blessed immortality beyond the grave. That's what they were looking for. So they invented this afterlife, you know, and, uh, and the entrance into this afterlife was based on, on how well a, per a, a person practiced their religion. Not how good they were, but how well they practiced their religion. In other words, in Christianity it's not basically whether you're good, they say it has nothing to do with anything. It's whether you say these magic words, you know. See, if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Well, they don't do it. Because receiving Jesus Christ as Lord specifically means you must do what he says. And what he taught was the single eye meditation as the first thing a person must do. And that's the one thing that Christians say is evil. So how can they be saved? Anyhow. But long before there was Jesus Christ, long before there was Christianity, people tried to find salvation in what was called the Kingdom of Osiris, O-S-I-R-I-S. -I before Osiris was Tem, or Ra, R-A, the father of all. And, 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 and Ra came out of, a, of an egg. He, he laid an egg in the chaotic waters of the earth, and then he himself was born from that egg. It's the same thing where, you know, Mary is both the husband uh, and the mother of God. And that egg, the, the, the birth of the Savior from the egg is, is part and parcel of the, 
of the Easter myth. Of course, <laughs> that's one of the strange things in Christianity where they, they call their holiest day Easter because it, it comes from the um, Astarte or Ishtar of Babylon, which is the goddess of fertility, the goddess of actual sex, the goddess of sexual intercourse was Easter. And uh, what they would do... Uh, the myth was that Tammuz, who was Easter's husband, and she, uh, he would die, and then every spring he would come out of a gray-colored egg, and uh, they would have great celebrations. But they had a 40-day period before he rose from the egg in which they all put stuff, the ashes, and they mourned and so forth. And then they would go out and they would face the east at the point of the rising sun, and they would have these great services. And then uh, on, on this day, of fulfillment, uh, they would all go to the temple, and the women of the temple had to uh, have sexual intercourse with the first guy that came to church. This is true, I'm telling you. This is in ba you know, Babylon. And because uh, I always say to people, Jesus, all they had to do was wear their Easter bonnet. They didn't have to, they didn't have to wear anything else. But uh, this is the day, and they, had, and they had bunnies, and they had chicks, and all of the stuff. This is the day that Christianity accepts as its holy day. So, I mean, that, that in of itself should say something's wrong here. You know? Anyhow, but when God came from the egg, he became Ra. Amen, Ra. Amen, Ra. That's interesting. Did you know his first name was Amen? That's why you say Amen when you end your prayers, because it's, you're saying, well, so be it. It doesn't mean that. Amen is the name of the Egyptian sun god, and it's an homage to the god Amen. Uh, and in the great temples of Egypt, they would always... A chant out, Amen, Amen, Amen. And in fact, and Jesus calls himself the Amen in Revelation 3 something, 3.16 I believe it is, in which he then identifies himself as the Egyptian sun god. And you're going to say, oh, hey, come on, now you've gone too far. Jesus wasn't the Egyptian sun god. Matthew 2 says, Mary and Joseph took the child Jesus to Egypt to fulfill the prophecy, out of Egypt have I called my son. Hmm. Well, when Ra was born out of the egg, he gave life to his daughter, whose name was Mat, M-A-A-T. She represented spirit. Then Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, his son was the word. So there you have Ra the father, Mat the spirit, and Thoth the word. You have Jesus, Mary, Joseph. You have Jesus, the son, God, the Father, and the Spirit. That's the Trinity. The Word made flesh was Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. -H. John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, which means dwelling inside of yourself. Then, in Memphis, now this is not Memphis, Tennessee, where uh, Elvis came from. This is Memphis, Egypt. An interesting thing happened. The story of creation in Memphis, Egypt, was that God took his um, phallus, which is his uh, male sexual organ, in his right hand, and he masturbated. And the semen that fell touched the ground, and life was given to the earth. Okay, now you say, oh, that's terrible. No, it's no more terrible than God impregnating a woman who, you know, didn't understand what was going on. Who do you think was born out of the semen that fell from God onto the earth in Memphis, Egypt? Adam. <laughs> Long before the Bible was written, Adam. But it wasn't spelled A-D-A-M, it was spelled A-T-U-M, Atom, which is the same as Atom, A-T-O-M. It's the center of all life. The center of life, the center of the universe is Adam, A-T-O-M. But the first person that was born according to the, to the uh, archives of, of creation of Memphis, Egypt, was Atom, A-T-U-M. And of course, the name was changed to fit the English culture in uh, Genesis to Adam, A-D-A-M. But it's the same. Don't you see? Remember in the book of Genesis when it says that uh, God took a rib out of Adam and made Eve, you know, procreated the species? When you take an electron from an atom, you multiply the energy. So, what's being said here? God took a rib out of Adam? Come on. Or is the Bible saying that life began by the splitting of the atom? Aha! Of course, a lot of fundamentalists will get upset with that because it makes too much sense, you know? Not supposed to make sense. The Bible does make sense when you get behind the, um, the words. 
So anyhow, when Adam came forth also out of this life, were produced a brother-sister divinity known as Shu and Tefnut. And they gave birth to Seb, the earth god, and guess who the sky goddess was? Remember, Seb means the earth, the body. The sky goddess, who means the head, the consciousness. You know what her name was? Nut. N-U-T. Huh? That's why you say, oh, he's a nut. Well, you don't say he's a nut for no reason, because the sky goddess, or that which represented consciousness in Egypt out of Memphis, was named Nut. So, the Sumerians which were a very ancient culture, established a, a superior culture. They constructed canals, they controlled the flood worlds of the Nile, they went into agriculture and all that stuff. They made bread, they brewed ale, they made beer. They used to have beer back in those days. They, and, and I'll tell you what the Sumerians did in this culture that way before the Bible. They lengthened the year from 360 to 365 days. The divine God who looked over their development was the God-man incarnate. Incarnate means in that which is carnal. That's why Jesus is God incarnate. In that which is carnal, in the center of the carnal mind is that holy place where we touch with meditation. But this God-man of Samaria was known as Osiris, O-S-I-R-I-S. -I -I and the Egyptian legend about Osiris was quite the same as that which is Jesus. It, he was human, his parent was God, he was divine and human. Of course he was long before Jesus, but it's the same story, in, in the same way that, uh, that the story of um, Hare Krishna was. But there's something that, that should be very familiar, as I tell it to you from ancient Egypt, and, and that's the tribal, what they call totem, T-O-T-E-M. This was taken uh, from ancient aboriginal uh, tribes, you know, an animal was slain and eaten, and it then became the literal sacrifice of God. In other words, they would kill these animals, and then they'd say, that's God that's being killed, and the people then would eat the animal, and they absorbed the God's power. See? And it says in Exodus 29.1, and this is the thing that you shall do unto them to hallow them, let me consecrate, to minister to me in the priest's office, take one young bullock and two rams. You ever read that stuff in the Bible? They're killing all these bulls and rams and all this stuff. That's, that, that, came, that, came, that came out of Samaria. That's where they did it. I mean, the reason that you have Jesus dying is, is, is a continuation of human sacrifice. Prior to human sacrifice, they had animal sacrifice. And our, our, our Christian heritage is Jesus comes to be Lord and we want to spend eternity with Jesus. That's the Christian heritage. The Egyptians lived and died in devotion to Osiris. He was the beloved God of the people. And their highest hope was to die and become one in eternity with Osiris. It's the same story. Exactly the same story story. And this is the mystery of Osiris. It's really interesting stuff. Only those who were initiated into Osiris could know his doctrines. For, the, for there was an exceedingly great mystery, and in the handwriting of the God himself, and it says these things must be done secretly. Did you hear what I said? That's the mystery of Osiris. You couldn't get into this and understand this unless you were initiated into the mystery of Osiris, and everything was done in secret. Now Jesus says in Mark 4.11, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. See? And, and, and these parables are the stuff that Christians take literally. And it says in Matthew 13.34 that without a parable, Jesus never spoke. Both the Egyptians and the Greeks declared that it was a sacrilege to reveal the doctrines of their mysteries. And what I'm telling you, the mystery of the kingdom, which has not previously, maybe even to this very moment, when you're sitting watching this on television, been revealed to you, is that the kingdom of God is in the right hemisphere of your brain. And you can activate it and open the door by doing what Jesus said in John 21, 6, and casting your net to the right side. 
How can people take this stuff literally in the Bible when you see it was duplicated years before in the ancient mysteries of the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Egyptians? How can you sit there and say it's your religion? It's their religion. You copied it. I wanted to just stop for a minute to tell you that if you would like, we have a videotape network in which we send out a videotape with teachings from the church, hidden meanings, teachings from the church. And all we ask you to do is when you receive the tape, after you've watched it, you send it on to the next person whose name we give you. It doesn't cost you anything. I'm going to give you a telephone number, so why don't you get a pencil and paper. And uh, you can call now, and we'll put you on the network. All you can do is leave your name and address. Okay, here's the number. Area code 609-971-0537. I'm going to turn the phone off here. Area code 609-971-0537. And the answering machine will pick up, and you just say, um, I want to be on the video network. And uh, we'll send the information to you. You see, when you take this stuff literally, and you think that Jesus was the only resurrected Savior, he wasn't. Mary was the only virgin to give birth to the Son of God. She wasn't. But when you take it literally, then you're destroying the real truth that this is the same old story that was given to every culture on the face of the earth. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, you'd be able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, and it does. It kills our relationships with other cultures. We should be all talking. Somebody calls their God Krishna or whatever. What's that? What's the big deal? It's the same God. Because the Bible says there's only one God, so it has to be the same God. They just call him by a different name. Why get ticked off about that? And Jesus said in John 16, 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but... You cannot bear them. Christians can't bear any of this stuff. They can't hear any of this stuff. They, they, they can't hear about uh, the astrological, I mean astrology. They get freaked out. Oh, don't talk to me about that. And yet in Genesis 1, the very first page, it says, God says, let the stars be for signs. Well, if the stars are for signs, shouldn't you figure out what they, what they mean? Psalm 147 says, God named all the stars. Why did he call them Sagittarius and Aquarius and Aquila and Coma? Why did he call them those things? Nobody knows. Do you know the whole Bible was written in the stars before it was ever put on paper? And you can read the Bible by looking at the stars? No, or you say, well, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. It's true. I say, well, I don't believe, uh, you know, that the stars influence people. Then why does it say in Job 38, 32, can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? Can you loose the bands of Orion? They're stars. And he said, it says in the Bible, it says they influence people. I'm telling you, it's a shame that we have been made afraid of nature and the cosmos by this religion that goes no further than a book. I'll share something with you that's really interesting. The sun god Ra from Egypt means the divine mind detected, he got married now to his wife. You know his wife's name was Nut. <laughs> that's the spiritual, you know, the emotions, the spiritual mind. He caught Nut embracing Seb, which is the earth god. Now what you have here in the myth is the fact that the spirit, the human spirit, Nut, the emotions, was embracing the lower mind, Seb. That's when, when we take from the lower mind, according to the Bible, it says we're, we're committing adultery because we should be taking from the higher mind. When you start taking from the thoughts of the lower mind, from the thoughts of your emotions, that's where you get into all the trouble. But Ra decreed because of this communion or this intercourse between the human spirit and the lower mind that her offspring, meaning Nut's offspring, could not be born on any day of the year. So that, you know, what would happen? You know, they, these offspring could not be born. Along comes Thoth. Remember Thoth we were talking about before, T-H-O-T-H? This is the same as our Jesus Christ, the Word. And he came and intervened on her behalf. And what he did, he won for her a 72nd portion of each day. And it added up to five additional days were added to the calendar. 
And you know what that happened? It made the movement of the earth to coincide with the sun for the seasons and gave us the 365 days of the year. That's where it came from. So Thoth rescued Nut, and she could give children, and she gave five children because of those five days. Day one, she gave birth to Osiris. On the second day, she gave birth to Horus. On the third day, she gave birth to Set. On the fourth day, to Isis. And on the fifth day, to Nephthys. And then, of course, as the, as the tradition and the culture went on, as you know, Isis married Osiris, and they, they, had, they gave birth to Horus, too. There's an interesting thing there. where There's a, there's a statue of Isis sitting on this chair, and she had the little baby Horus on her lap. And in one of the great Catholic cathedrals in Europe, used that exact sculpture uh, to show the uh, baby Jesus sitting on the lap of Mary. You know what's an interesting thing? When Osiris was killed, his body was cut up in well, about 14 parts. And Isis went all over the place looking, <laughs> and she found most of the parts, but the one part she was looking for was, guess what? Woo, yeah, you're right. His male, you know, sexual organ, the phallus. And she found that. Uh, no, I don't think, no, she didn't find she had a, She had a cast of it made. She never found it. But she had a cast of it made, uh, you know, a model of his erected uh, penis. And she sent it to all the temples in Egypt. And all the temples, it was decreed in Egypt, had to display the male sexual organ of Osiris in an erected state in a prominent place in the temple. My friends, do you know that is why you have steeples on your churches today? That's exactly what it was. And I know that's hard to take. Nonetheless, that's exactly where it came from. And the steeples of the ancient churches were known uh, for phallic, what they called phallic worship because it was the male sexual organ uh, the, the, the female reproductive, and genesis, genitals, the birth of all life. We made it into something filthy. We made it, we hide, oh, no, no. It's a beautiful thing, but that's exactly where it came from. The steeples of churches have their heritage in the erected male sexual organ of the god Osiris, and that was decreed by Isis. Anyhow, if you're, hey, <laughs> if you paid attention to nothing that I said through this half hour. I'll bet you don't forget that. Well, to make the long story short, Osiris was crowned king of Egypt in his 28th year. He ruled 28 years, and that number 28 actually relates to the lunar cycle. Of, of which, you know, you know, you have women have a 28-day cycle and so forth. It's all part of, comes out of the mythology. And Osiris conferred upon his people the culture of what was called the wheat and the barley, or the bread and the beer. And that was, uh, people would take bread and beer and become one with Osiris instead of actually eating people as they did earlier in the cannibalism. And then when the culture of Osiris spread to Greece, it became the culture of Dionysus, D-I-O-N-Y-S-U-S, and Dionysus was the god of wine. And uh, so then at that point, the communion became uh, bread and wine, of which uh, we are part of today. And we think, oh, this is our Holy Communion. No, it is not your Holy Communion. That's the Holy Communion of Osiris and Dionysus, which was passed on to Jesus Christ. Because we copied everything of our religion from the ancient cultures. <laughs> That's why Jesus said in John 6.53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. It gets interesting. We'll show you as we go in deeper into uh, discussions on the ancient uh, myth of Osiris and so forth that uh, we'll see Set, which actually is Satan. The origin of Satan was Set, S-E-T, and uh, making illicit advances to ISIS. Do you know another word of uh, another name for Set was Typhon, T-Y-P-H-O-N, which was a whirling, swirling wind of which the name Typhoon comes. But anyhow, we'll tell you at another time. Gotta go.